Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to be back. Good to see many of you again, although we saw many of you last week in New York. Um, speaking of last week in New York, the world came together last week to spotlight and, in nearly all cases, reaffirm the principles at the core of the UN Charter. President Biden cited one of his predecessors, President Truman, who heralded the Charter as proof that nations can, quote, state their differences, can face them, and then can find common ground on which to stand. And last week, we witnessed a tremendous amount of common ground among the UN's member states regarding Russia's illegal, unjustified invasion of Ukraine. Country after country in both the Security Council and General Assembly condemned Russia's war and called for an end to the invasion. They did so because not only is the Kremlin's war an assault on Ukraine, but it is also a stark affront to the principles at the heart of the UN Charter. Sovereignty, the independence of states, the inviolability of national borders, the tenets of peace and security. These are the principles that apply equally in Europe as they do anywhere and everywhere around the world. The statements from world leaders in New York crystallized the stakes, but so too did the statements and actions that emanated from Moscow. President Putin did perhaps as much as anyone last week to further isolate Russia and bolster international resolve to stand with Ukraine. His nuclear saber rattling, the sham referenda, his partial mobilization, and the broad and sometimes violent crackdown on Russians exercising their universal rights were galvanizing, but almost certainly not in the way that President Putin intended. These actions from President Putin signal very, signal very clearly that he knows he is losing. He's on his back heels, and he's making every attempt to intimidate those who would stand up to him. We, along with our allies and partners around the world, are not going to bow to intimidation. So let me state once again, the so-called referenda Russia is holding right now in the sovereign Ukrainian regions of Kherson, Zaporizhia, Luhansk, and Donetsk are a total sham. The United States will never recognize seize Ukrainian territory as anything other than part of Ukraine. We stand by Ukraine's sovereignty. As you saw today, we are increasing our support to our Ukrainian partners. The Secretary announced an additional $457.5 million in civilian security assistance to enhance the efforts of Ukrainian law enforcement and criminal justice agencies to improve their operational capacity and save lives as they continue to help defend the Ukrainian people, their freedom, and their democracy from the Kremlin's brutal war of aggression. This new tranche of aid brings the total, uh, brings the, total the United States has committed to our Ukrainian law enforcement and criminal justice partners since mid-December 2021 to more than 645 million. The provision of additional protective equipment, medical supplies, and armored vehicles to the National Police of Ukraine and the State Border Guard Service has significantly reduced casualties for Ukrainian civilians and their defenders. In addition to continuing and expanding our direct assistance to Ukrainian law enforcement, a portion of this new assistance will also continue U.S. support for the Ukrainian government's efforts to document, investigate, and prosecute atrocities perpetrated by Russia's forces, drawing on our longstanding relationship with the Ukrainian criminal <coughs> justice agencies. The United States stands, stands side by side with Ukrainian people, and we remain committed to supporting a democratic, independent, and sovereign Ukraine. With that, Matt. Thanks. Ted. Uh, just on the on the uh, additional aid, is it possible, you don't have to do it here, but if someone's got it, to break that down in terms of what goes to, and particularly interested in how much is going to go to the prosecutors and the, for the investigation, uh, but it would be good to know if we could get, you know, how much is going to go to armored vehicles and how much is going to go to PPE and that kind of thing. Understood. Possible to do? Okay. Um, secondly, um, which is not Ukraine specifically, and I know that your colleague at the White House was asked about this, um, but you've seen uh, President Putin giving uh, Russian citizenship to Edward Snowden. Back in um, 2013, when you guys, this building, the State Department, um, during the Obama administration revoked his passport, it was made clear by one of your predecessors uh, that this did not affect his citizenship, uh, that he was still, as far as the U.S. government is concerned, an American citizen. And I just want to know if that is still a 
And I'm not asking about any kind of prosecution, so please don't refer me to the Justice Department. Is it still the belief of the administration that he is a U.S. citizen? I'm not aware of any change in his citizenship uh, status. I am uh, familiar with the fact that he has in some ways denounced his uh, American citizenship. I don't know that he's renounced it. Right. Well, no, he hasn't. And in fact, when he applied for citizenship, he said he wasn't going to renounce it. But and I just but but there are ways in which the U.S. government can revoke one citizen. And as far as I know, he doesn't meet any of the or hasn't met any of the criteria yet. One of the four is committing an act of treason, which I know you'll refer to the Justice Department on. But I just want to make sure that as far as you're concerned, he remains an American citizen. So he's now a dual U.S. Russian citizen. Our, our position has not changed. Mr. Snowden should return to the United States where he uh, should face justice as any other American citizen would. Perhaps the only thing that has changed is that as a result of his Russian citizenship, uh, apparently now he may well be conscripted to fight in Russia's war in Ukraine. All right. Uh, last thing, and this has to do uh, specifically with your comments about President Putin and uh, his uh, what he did last week the reaction to what he has recently announced last week at the UN, as it our during the UN, as it relates to sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I just want to make sure that, that I understand correctly that your one China policy, right, means that Taiwan is part of China and that you respect Chinese territorial integrity and sovereignty over Taiwan. Matt, our, our one China policy has not changed. Our one China policy has not changed well, what does your in, one the China sum, policy in the sum of 40 years. Chinese territorial uh, integrity. Very, very basically, we don't take a position on sovereignty. But our uh, one China policy has not changed. That is, a, that is a position we made very clear in public. It is a position that Secretary Blinken made very clear in private uh, to Wang Yi when he met with him on Friday. Does that mean that Taiwan is part of China? <laughs> it's one China, right? Uh, again, Saeed, our, our one policy has our one China policy has not changed. Uh, we don't take a position on sovereignty, uh, but the policy uh, that has been at the crux of our approach uh, to Taiwan since 1979 uh, remains in effect today. What we want to see continue, what we want to see preserved, uh, is the status quo, precisely because the status quo since 1979, more than 40 years now, uh, has undergirded uh, peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. We want to see that continue. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe the same could be said of the PRC, which uh, has uh, become only more coercive and intimidating in its actions and its maneuvers across the Taiwan Strait. Andrea. Uh, just to follow up on that, can, if, if Vladimir Putin has conferred Russian citizenship on Edward Snowden today, as they say. Does that mean he automatically loses his American citizenship, whether or not he's renounced it? I'm, I'm not aware of any change in his American citizenship status. Uh, I'm not aware that anything has happened uh, yet when it comes to that. Um, Mr. Snowden is uh, apparently now a Russian citizen. Uh, and again, that uh, makes him subject uh, to any Russian decrees that may come down, including the one we heard about last week. Uh, what are your bets, bets on that? Let me ask you a China question. Wait, 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 just one second, because this is this is kind of interesting. Because if he's now, <laughs> you say he's now a Russian citizen, but I, he's I, also I, an American citizen. I, well, right? I didn't say that. I said that obviously the Russians have put out a formal decree. Yes, exactly. Yes. But, so apparently he is both U.S. and Russian citizen. Now, when it comes to Iran. So, U.S. Americans, the Iranian government does not treat the U.S. dual nationals as dual nationals, right? They treat them only as single <coughs> and And you deplore that, and you denounce it when they get arrested and charged under Iranian law. And yet here you seem to be happy, by the, or you seem to be enjoying the There's idea you. that somehow now as a Russian citizen, Ed Snowden could, Edward Snowden could be... Uh, there is no emotion attached to my voice, Matt. I am just saying that a okay. Russian citizen, uh, he would presumably be subject to Russian laws. Andrew. Uh, a related question on China. Can you tell us whether during the president's 
the president, excuse me, the Secretary of State's meeting with Barney on Friday, uh, he brought up the issue of wrongfully detained American Kai Lee, who's been detained for five years in China. In just about every single one of our engagements around the world at senior levels, uh, we raise cases of American detainees, Americans who are wrongfully detained uh, when appro appropriate and applicable, Americans who are being held hostage uh, around the world. Uh, we have consistently raised uh, cases of Americans who are wrongfully detained in China or who are otherwise unable to freely depart uh, the PRC, uh, we will continue to do that until such cases are resolved. Was it raised in this instance I, I'm, on Friday? I'm, it is something we consistently raise. But that doesn't, you, that doesn't, can you take the question of whether it was raised on Friday? It is. It, we issued a readout of this. It's something we consistently raise, but uh, we're not in a position to go beyond what the What is readout. the latest on Kylie's case, and do we have consular access? Uh, I will have to get back to you on the question of consular access, but uh, these are cases that uh, we regularly do discuss with our PRC counterparts. These are cases that uh, the embassy in Beijing uh, routinely works on, uh, just in the same way that uh, our embassies around the world uh, work on behalf of American citizens who are uh, wrongfully detained, but when it comes to all instances of Americans who are detained uh, around the world to provide them appropriate consular uh, support in line with the Vienna Convention uh, uh, on consular access. What about China and Russia and Korea? Uh, Chinese uh, issues, there are reports that Russia is pushing to recruit Chinese Russian soldiers to fight Ukraine. If this is true, then China will engage in military cooperation with Russia. How would you assess this? Did you ever hear about it? Could you repeat the first part of the question? Yeah, there are reports that Russia is pushing to China, I mean, Chinese Russian soldiers to fight Ukraine. I mean, uh, these who are Chinese living in Russia, maybe. Chinese nationals living in Russia who would yes. then go uh, fight in Ukraine. Uh, I, I am not familiar with these with these reports. Uh, with as I mentioned a moment ago, when it comes to the, to the secretary's engagement with Wang Yi on Friday, there was a discussion uh, of Russia and its illegal, unjustified invasion of. Uh, Ukraine. This, of course, was also a, a topic of conversation at the UN. We heard uh, from Wang Yi himself uh, in the UN Security Council. Uh, Wang Yi, during that setting, uh, made very clear uh, that the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should be safeguarded. The purposes and principles of the UN Charter uh, should be uh, abided by. All parties concerned should exercise restraint and avoid words and deeds. Uh, that aggravate con confrontation. Uh, so uh, the test will be whether uh, these words from the PRC are actually implemented. Uh, we have made clear, and the Secretary made clear again to uh, his PRC counterpart on Friday, that we are watching very closely. Uh, we know that Russia has sought assistance from the PRC uh, we know early on uh, in this conflict that Russia lodged a request for military assistance. We made that public at the time. We warned uh, both publicly and privately at the time that the PRC would face uh, consequences if it provided security, security assistance uh, to Russia or if it uh, assisted Russia in a systematic way, uh, evade sanctions. We haven't seen uh, the PRC do either of those. Uh, we're continuing to watch uh, very closely. But again, our message uh, to the PRC has been a simple one. Uh, China should not make Russia's problems China's problems. But the recent period, uh, Xi Jinping and Chinese uh, government, I mean, President Xi Jinping and the uh, Russian President team had meeting together. You never know what they, they're talking about, what kind of conversation they did, you know. So how are you going to trust China and Russia? Their trust is, is very important. We're not trusting, we're verifying. Uh, we are uh, looking at every single bit of information we have. We have seen nothing 
as of yet at least, to indicate that the PRC is taking a different, different approach uh, when it comes to security assistance, when it comes to efforts to systematically help uh, Russia evade sanctions, but we're continuing to watch. We know that conversations, including at high levels, as we saw in Samarkand the other week, between the PRC and Russia are ongoing. Uh, what I will say is that if you look at President Putin's words, if you look at President Xi's words, if you read uh, Wang Yi's words, the very words I just referred to, uh, you hear the PRC expressing uh, a degree of unease with what Russia is doing in Ukraine. And that's really no surprise. It's no surprise because Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine is not only, as I said at the top, an assault on Ukraine. It is an assault, a brutal assault, on the UN Charter, on the UN system, on every member state of the United Nations that subscribes to them. Uh, so it's no wonder that the PRC is expressing varying degrees of reservations. The real test, though, will be if those apparent reservations, this apparent discomfort with what Russia is doing in Ukraine, uh, will actually contour what the PRC does um, in its approach. One more quick, uh, the South Korean President Yoon Sung Yeol said that uh, yesterday, in the event of a dispute between China and Taiwan, the possibility of North Korean provocation would increase. Does the United States want South Korea to support U.S. defense to Taiwan? We have uh, an ironclad alliance with our South Korean partners. It is an alliance that is built not only on shared interests uh, in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also on shared values. And one of the re many reasons for our support for uh, the people on Taiwan is the fact that we share values uh, with, uh, the, with the uh, people on Taiwan. Uh, that is also true of our South Korean allies. Uh, so we have a shared interest together with South Korea, together with uh, our other allies in the region uh, in upholding a free uh, an open Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's something we routinely discuss and something uh, we routinely act upon. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Change of subject? Sure. Yeah. Anything else on China? Russia. Uh, let's, uh, we'll go to Iran and then we'll come back to Russia. Okay. Thank you, Manet. Um, today was the 10th day of continuous protests in Iran. Um, the Biden administration has sanctioned people and entities. Uh, it has issued the general license for providing technology to Iranian people for communication. But that hasn't stopped um, the law enforcement from killing people. Then their number is rising. Um, what, what can uh, the U.S. administration do to stop the killing? Let me first start by saying that we, of course, condemn uh, the violence, the brutality that is being exhibited by uh, Iran's security forces, uh, the ongoing violent suppression of what are peaceful protests following Masa Amini's death uh, is appalling. We are aware that security forces have killed uh, dozens of protesters. We believe it is incumbent upon the international community to speak out, uh, to make clear uh, where they stand when it comes to the exercise of what should be universal rights, rights that are belong to the people of Iran as much as they do to people anywhere and everywhere uh, ac across the globe. We're closely following these developments. Uh, Iran's leaders should be listening to the protesters, not firing on them. Uh, unfortunately, this regime is one that has a long history of using violence against those who would peacefully exercise those universal rights. Uh, the United States, uh, whether it is protesters in Iran, whether it is protesters in Russia, whether it is peaceful protesters around the world, we support the rights of these individuals, these Iranians in this case, to peacefully assemble and to express themselves uh, without fear of violence or detention by security forces. Uh, we are going to continue to do a couple things. Uh, we, as you know, as you alluded to, are holding to account the so-called morality police, the entity uh, that is responsible for Masa Amini's death. Uh, we sanctioned seven other individuals who have been 
involved in Iran's uh, repression over the years. And we are doing uh, what we can to enable the people of Iran to exercise those universal rights. And you mentioned the general license that we issued on uh, Friday. Uh, people, countries around the world have an interest in seeing to it uh, that the people of Iran can communicate freely uh, with one another, uh, can communicate freely uh, with, with the rest of the world. Uh, and we all have an interest in knowing about what's going on inside of Iran, what the brave Iranian people are peacefully doing in response uh, to the tragic death of, of Masa Amini. Um, you mentioned you, the Biden administration urges the international community to speak out. Well, Germany has summoned, uh, today summoned the Iranian ambassador to Berlin and uh, apparently asked them not to um, suppress the people. But that that's not going to stop you know, uh, the law enforcement and uh, would, would do you think uh, maybe he's um, recalling ambassadors from Iran? Would that be a, um, a more effective uh, means of Iran's isola isolation and maybe rethinking of their policy? This is going to be a sovereign decision on the part of countries around the world. Uh, we have encouraged and we do encourage, we are encouraging, countries around the world to lend, of course, rhetorical support to uh, these Iranians who are doing nothing more than exercising peacefully uh, their universal rights. For our part, we have used our own authorities. We have uh, granted uh, a license using, using a Treasury Department uh, authority, but different countries are going to have uh, different approaches. What is uh, less important to us is that these approaches are, are identical. What is more important to us is that these approaches are complementary, uh, that they work together to support uh, both the rights and the aspirations of the people of Iran. Uh, Ned, on, on this point, get, uh, get, well, yeah, like you've already yeah, asked, so let me quick. go over here, so, please. Um, not that I question how Masa Amini, or Gina Amini, as she, she, she was calling herself, uh, died. We've spoken to her family members that they're, they've kind of confirmed how you know she died. but. I'm just curious, how would you determine that she was killed by morality police? Because the Iranian government is trying to float the idea that she died as a result of a heart attack, this attack. There, there are certain facts of this case that don't seem to be in dispute. Uh, Masa Amini was arrested. Masa Amini, of course, was alive at the time of her arrest. There is video uh, of her uh, after her arrest. And sometime later, she was dead after uh, spending time in the custody of the so-called morality police. Uh, the facts don't seem that complicated. And then on the general license, need to, uh, there are, so the, the Starlink um, services that um, has kind of given a lot of hope to a lot of Iranians, but does the, the general license, does that also include hardware? Because the terminals and the dishes that require us to use some service like the Starlink, does that also include hardware for to get to Iran? So the short answer is yes. Uh, both GLD-2, the general license we issued last week, uh, but also GLD-1, uh, the general license that we issued in 2014 uh, under the Obama-Biden administration, uh, include, includes uh, some forms of, of hardware. Let me, this is not a, a, um, a, a simple issue, so let me give you a little bit more context. GLD-2 uh, expands authorizations for software services uh, but it does continue to authorize certain hardware, uh, including residential consumer satellite terminals uh, that were already authorized under GLD-1, the general license from 2014. Uh, general licenses are self-executing. Uh, what that means is that anyone who meets the criteria outlined in this general license can proceed with their activities uh, without requesting additional permission <laughs> from the U.S. government. Now, some types of equipment, including uh, some, uh, including certain commercial uses and work with work with sanctioned entities, still require a specific license from Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control or OFAC uh, before they can be exported to Iran. Uh, but on Friday, OFAC also expanded its policy for issuing case by case specific licenses, uh, and now OFAC will prioritize any request for a specific license pertaining to internet freedom uh, in Iran. So back to your question on Starlink. 
if SpaceX, in this case, were to determine that some activity aimed at Iranians requires a specific license, again, this would need to be a judgment that SpaceX and its lawyers would come to on their own, uh, OFAC would welcome it and would prioritize it. Uh, by the same token, if SpaceX determines that, it, that its activity is already authorized, again, owing to the self-executing nature of uh, these general licenses, uh, OFAC would welcome any engagement, including if SpaceX or any other uh, company were to have uh, questions about uh, the applicability of uh, this general license or the 2014 general license to their envisioned activity. And, and just quickly to revisit her question. So more than 30 people have died on the hands of Iranian authorities. Will we see tougher reaction from the U.S. or is just that first uh, sanction on the Iranian rock? Uh, we're doing two things. Uh, as we were talking about in the context of this general license, uh, we are taking steps that we can to facilitate uh, the ability of the Iranian people to communicate with one another, to communicate with the rest of the world, essentially uh, doing what we can to support uh, the peaceful uh, aspirations uh, of the Iranian people for greater levels of uh, freedom uh, and uh, for uh, the respect of uh, rights that are universal to them. Uh, at the same time, we're also going, we have held to account, and we will continue uh, to hold to account uh, those Iranians who are responsible for acts of violence, for acts of repression against their own people. Of course, the sanctions that we issued on Thursday of last week, the sanctions against morality, uh, so-called morality police, and seven other individuals, uh, those are not the first human rights sanctions we've levied against Iran, uh, they will not be the last human rights sanctions we levied against Iran. Yeah. 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 Let me move around to people who have not asked questions. Iran, on the internet. Uh, so um, Elon Musk has said in recent days that in order for Starlink to work in Iran, there would have to be a terminal in the country that would enable it to actually be activated. And he said that would require someone smuggling um, that criminal into the country, which would be challenging because the Iranian government doesn't want it there. Does the U.S. support someone smuggling that into the country if you are in a position right now where you're supporting bringing freedom of internet to the Iranians? We have, the Treasury Department, uh, through the general license, has taken steps that, uh, through its self-executing capacity authorizes additional companies to provide software, in some cases hardware, uh, that would be operational uh, in Iran. Of course, we're not going to speak to uh, what would be required for any such hardware uh, to get into Iran. Uh, it is our charge, it is our responsibility to see to it that there are no <coughs> restrictions, U.S. government restrictions, uh, that would prevent uh, relevant software, and in some cases hardware, um, from being operational in Iran. But isn't that action on behalf of Treasury a bit meaningless if they can't actually get the hardware into the country? Uh, again, it, it is our charge to see to it that the Iranian people uh, have what they need to communicate with one another, to communicate mm -hmm. with the rest of the world. Uh, private companies are going to take steps uh, that they deem appropriate, whether it's uh, the authorization, the use of software inside of Iran, uh, or the provision of, of hardware to people of Iran. And just one more question. Are you encouraging um, allies of the United States to support this effort, allies that may have diplomats or diplomatic presence in Iran? We are supporting countries around the world uh, to do what they can uh, to support the aspirations of the Iranian people for greater freedom, greater respect uh, for human rights. I just, yeah, I just wanted to add. Just very briefly, our, our correspondent there an hour or so ago was telling me that there has been no evidence of any internet right now. It's completely shut down. Have you seen any tangible evidence since Treasury's announcement on Friday? Okay that there is more internet access for people? Uh, so I couldn't speak to internet access uh, broadly. Uh, what is true is that uh, the Iranian government uh, has consistently, since these protests began, uh, cut off or attempted to cut off internet access to large swaths uh, of the Iranian people. Uh, by uh, some, some uh, accounts, the Iranian government has cut off access for most of its 80 million 
uh, citizens to prevent them and to prevent the rest of the world uh, from watching uh, the regime's ongoing violent crackdown against peaceful protesters. And it's clear from these actions that Iran's <laughs> leaders are, in essence, afraid of their own people. And so we are committed to ensuring that the Iranian people can exercise uh, what is, again, a universal right, the universal right to freedom of expression, the universal right uh, to freely access information via the internet. Uh, and that's why we took this step uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, there is um, reason to believe that uh, companies are taking, act taking action pursuant to the general license that was issued uh, on Thursday of last week. Uh, we do encourage companies that have questions uh, as to whether their uh, software or whether their capabilities uh, are authorized under this general license to reach out to OPAC. And again, even if this general license doesn't authorize the specific piece of software or hardware that a company may have in mind, uh, OFAC, as a result of action we took last week, will prioritize a review of specific license. And, and that is for a very simple reason. We want to do everything we possibly can to support the Iranian people's exercise of their universal right. Now, I just want, on, on this issue, how do you expect this, uh, the, uh, this tragic <clears throat> incident to impact the, uh, the talks, uh, the end of talks, or going back to the, uh, to the deal or not going back to the deal? I mean, does it, in a sense, does it die the you in this case of going back so quickly or? Let's say you know, a short period of time, considering that there's so much apparently opposition uh, to the government. You know, how do you factor that in? Uh, this does this in no way uh, changes our determination to see to it uh, that Iran can is permanently uh, and verifiably barred from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, it is, uh, of course, a, a fact as we've made clear. Uh, that these negotiations are uh, not in a healthy place right now. Uh, we've uh, made clear that uh, while we have been sincere and steadfast in our efforts uh, to see to it that Iran is once again permanently and verifiably barred from uh, a nuclear weapon, we haven't seen uh, the Iranians make the decision, the Iranian government make the decision that it would need to make uh, if it were to commit to a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. But the simple fact remains that every single challenge we face with the Iranian government would become more difficult, in some ways more intractable, uh, if Iran were in the possession of a nuclear weapon. We think about that not only in terms of Iran's ballistic missile program, not only in terms of its support for terrorist groups and proxies, not only in terms of its support in um, malign activity in cyberspace, uh, but also for the types of human rights abuses that we're talking about now. Every single challenge we face uh, would become more difficult uh, if Iran uh, were to be in possession of one. Yes. Um, Iranian foreign minister said, I guess on Sunday, that the U.S. is still reaching out, um, saying that we have good wills, we have good faith, and we want to tailor a deal. Can you confirm that comment? Like I said a moment ago, we are determined the president has a commitment uh, to see to it that uh, Iran can never and will never acquire a nuclear weapon. Have you sent any messages in the last 10 days? Uh, look, we have made very clear uh, to Iran uh, that we have certain requirements and we are not going to accept a bad deal, uh, as you heard. Uh, the secretary say last night, Iran responded to uh, the most recent EU proposal in such a way that did not put us in a position to close the deal, but actually uh, moved us backwards uh, somewhat. Uh, I'm not aware uh, of any further uh, back and forth uh, with the EU from Iran. Uh, as of now, based on uh, Iran's positions, which it reaffirmed very publicly in, in New York uh, this week. Uh, we don't see a deal coming together anytime soon. And do you see any urgency to change your policy towards Iran? There are so many different op-eds being published in recent days urging Biden to change its Iran policy at the moment with what is going on inside Iran. Do you see any urgency to change your policy towards Iran? 
our policy when it comes to the protests that are that are ongoing in Tehran? Protests and also the nuclear. Well, these are of course uh, separate issues. Uh, when it comes Maybe to not for Iranian people. When it when it comes to the Iranian people and when it comes to the protests, uh, of course we're taking action and we have taken action in response uh, to the peaceful protests. We've talked. We've we've already spoken to two of those steps: the issuance of the general license uh, and the levying of sanctions against. Uh, the so-called morality police and the seven individuals. Um, we are going to continue to take steps both on that path towards accountability and continue to look at steps that would facilitate the Iranian people exercising what are universal rights. Um, right now, when it comes to the nuclear path, uh, there doesn't seem to be a, a, new, a near term uh, path ahead for us. Uh, we continue to believe that uh, uh, diplomacy is the best option to see to it that Iran is uh, never in possession of a nuclear weapon. Uh, and uh, we are going to pursue the path of a potential mutual return to the JCPOA uh, for as long as it's in our national interest, but only for as long uh, as it's in our national interest. But that, I think the point is, is that if you, if you go ahead and get a deal, you're going to be giving Iran is going to be getting hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, in both sanctions relief plus oil revenue. It's not like they're going to be using that money to plant flowers around, you know, downtown Tehran. There, some of that money is going to be go, go to further repress the, the Iranian people, the kind of things that you're seeing right now. So I guess the, the question is, her, or another way to phrase that question is, are you okay with that? Are you okay with giving them that massive amount of sanctions relief and allowing them to sell their oil on the open market uh, when you know that some of that money is going to be used to commit human rights abuses? Uh, two things, Matt. If, and this is a big if right now, if there is a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA, it would remove what would be the most dangerous right. elements uh, of an Iranian regime uh, I, I get that, but for, for you, keep saying, you, keep, uh, you keep saying if, but you also at the same time say that you still believe it is in the U.S. national interest to, as to, of, get, to get a deal as of today, as, right? as, as of right so now. That, that suggests that the administration is okay with getting a deal, even if it gives them billions, potentially, of uh, in do, billions of dollars that they can use to further repress their own people. Uh, so the first point was uh, the big if associated with the mutual return to compliance, but we remain committed, and President Biden has personally made a commitment that Iran uh, will never possess a nuclear weapon. We continue to believe that diplomacy is the best way to achieve that if uh, we find ourselves in a position to return to uh, the JCPOA. That does not remove from our arsenal a single tool uh, when it comes to holding Iran accountable for the types of things that we're talking about now. But uh, it gives them hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. It, and we would, it, uh, the sanctions relief, the limited sanctions relief that would come with uh, a mutual return to compliance on Iran's nuclear program, of course, uh, would be accompanied by the same set of policy options that we have today uh, to take action, to hold accountable uh, actors and entities who engage in the very human rights abuses that we're seeing in the absence so you're suggesting of a nuclear that there deal. could be a net zero for Iran if they go if, they, if you agree to a deal that you would give them this relief and then take it all back again we're, under the under we're the we're, we're talking rights. about a, a hypothetical right. we're talking about a hypothetical that is under the umbrella of another right. hypothetical so I'm 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 loath to well, continue but uh, too far down this path like but you're, you're willing to make that trade off that you're willing to give the, in exchange for a deal which may or may not work for however long it would last for. But in exchange for that, you're willing to give them all this money, which you know they will use at least some of, to further repress these people, to further support uh, you know, uh, their proxies in Yemen and Syria and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Is that that's correct? Uh, Matt, what is correct is that we have a commitment that Iran will never be in a position to acquire a nuclear weapon. We are going to... Bye bye. We are going to see that commitment carried out. Uh, our preference, our strong preference, of course, is to do that uh, diplomatically. If there's not a deal, we have tools on the table to respond to Iran's repression. That, by the way, is taking place in a context that 
uh, is in the absence of a deal. Uh, and if there is a deal, if Iran changes course um, and agrees to the terms that the United States and our uh, European allies are comfortable with, that won't remove a single tool uh, that we have to respond uh, to Iran's repression, to respond to its support for proxies, to respond for its support for terrorist groups. Uh, the, the simple point is the one I've already made. Uh, if Iran is in possession of a nuclear weapon or is not permanently and verifiably barred uh, from ever obtaining a nuclear weapon, uh, Iran would and potentially could uh, benefit from a sense of impunity that would come with that, come with that, to act even uh, more boldly on both at home and on the world stage. It is not like Iran is um, a benevolent actor in the absence of a deal. And there are many data points uh, to suggest that from the period at which the last administration left the GC JCPOA uh, at a time when Iran was complying with it, through the period of so-called maximum pressure, uh, Iran's behavior in the region, uh, its uh, actions against our partners, uh, the potential targeting even uh, of American facilities and personnel, uh, it didn't become more docile. It became more aggressive, uh, and for our interests, it became deadlier. Just on a note, the suppression of people was always there with JCPOA or without JCPOA. The suppression of people inside Iran was always there. It doesn't matter if you had a nuclear deal or not. Um, I want to ask you this, and I want you to please be very clear. Which one is more within your national interest? Supporting Iranian people, to be more precise, brave Iranian women, or reaching a nuclear deal with Iran? Which one is within your national interest more? Both are a national interest of ours. Uh, these are uh, core to uh, our... Uh, interests and in, into our values. Uh, so, uh, of course, we are committed, President Biden is committed uh, to seeing to it that Iran is never in possession of a nuclear weapon. The JCPOA is one diplomatic means by which uh, to achieve that. But we're also committed to the idea that human rights are at the center of our foreign policy. And you've seen us illustrate that. You've seen us live up to that. Uh, even in recent days, when it comes to Iran, taking action against the so-called morality police, against individuals, uh, providing the general license, uh, the other steps that we have taken to support the universal rights of the Iranian people. And these are steps that we've taken around the world to support uh, the peaceful exercise of universal rights in countries around the world. Uh, 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 I think what we're trying to figure out here is that when you speak to any Iranian activist, they will tell you, hey, each time we go out to states to challenge our leadership, the U.S. supports us, but then the U.S. turns behind our back and starts talking to the very region that actually we question its legitimacy. So that you can't have both when Iranian people are out there and trying to overthrow the regime. Well, uh, to be very clear, the, the protests that we're seeing aren't about the United States. They're not about us. Uh, these protests are about the legitimate aspirations of the Iranian people to exercise peacefully the rights that are as much theirs as they are anywhere else. Uh, we think all people's basics, basic rights should be respected. Of course, that includes uh, inside Iran. Uh, we think that all people should be able to peacefully protest uh, when their basic and universal rights uh, are violated. That includes in Iran. Uh, we are helping people around the world, including uh, in Iran, access personal uh, telecommunications technology. Uh, this, of course, is not a regime change policy. Uh, if any government, including the government in Iran, thinks that this is or amounts to a, re a regime change policy, uh, it poses some pretty difficult questions to them uh, about the nature uh, of their regime and why they would fear their own people. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, Mia, thank you, Ned. So you just announced today, before this meeting, before this briefing, um, that the United States uh, is designating uh, Diana Kaim Kaimakovic 
a state prosecutor in uh, the Bosnia and Herzegovina. She is in the state prosecutor's office. What can you tell us about this case and can we expect more sanctions uh, in the other countries uh, of the Western Balkans? So uh, one of our goals when it comes to the Western Balkans is uh, working with governments and working with uh, people of the region uh, to target, to take out, and to, to root out corruption. Uh, and sanctions are one important tool to do that. We did announce, uh, and Treasury did announce sanctions this morning on a state prosecutor general who had engaged in acts of corruption. Uh, we provided information in that statement. Treasury may have additional information regarding the basis for uh, that designation. Uh, and sanctions will remain uh, an important tool, one important tool, not the only important tool, but one important tool uh, when it comes to the region and it comes to our goal, uh, the goal that we share with governments and people in the region of rooting out corruption. Uh, just one, one more on the Western Balkans. I have interviewed uh, last week the Prime Minister of Montenegro, uh, Dritan Abrazovic, and he uh, called on the U.S. to help uh, Western Balkans um, against the influence of Russia and China in the region. So what has been your assessment um, of those influences in the Western Balkans and what specifically, um, which steps can you take in order to, to counter that influence? Well, it's no question that uh, the Western Balkans uh, is a dynamic region that uh, is attractive to countries around the world. Uh, of course, it's attractive for different re reasons uh, to both the PRC and, and Russia. Uh, we believe, and this is the point that we've made uh, both publicly and, and in our private engagements with countries in the Western Balkans, uh, that our shared interests and our shared values uh, form the predicate for a relationship that in many ways is unique and uh, distinct from the visions of a relationship that Russia or the PRC uh, would have for the region. So uh, whether it is uh, development, uh, whether it is security, whether it's uh, economics, whether it is uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, we have made very clear uh, our desire to be a partner to the countries of the Western Balkans uh, and have uh, both uh, implicitly and in some cases explicitly also been very clear uh, about what the partnership that we bring uh, is distinct uh, from the relationship that countries like the two you mentioned uh, would seek to have in the region. Uh, yes. I think. Thank you. Switch topic very quickly. Uh, we heard the president last week, the president of the United States, uh, call for a two-state solution. We heard the Israeli prime minister call for two, the two-state solution and so on. So what is the holdup? I mean, why can't we, I, I'm not getting any younger, you know, so what is the holdup? Why can't we get this process going, perhaps by maybe you know, sponsoring some sort of a negotiation for, between the two? Said, in, in some ways, if, if only there were a holdup, uh, this is not something that can be dictated uh, by any one country, by any one entity, not by the United States, uh, not by anyone else. The conditions have to be right for Israelis and Palestinians uh, to sit together uh, and to make progress on the very complex and controversial issues that are at the core of a two-state solution. So just as you and I have discussed many times, it is our charge in the intervening period to try to set the stage, to try to set the conditions uh, the conditions for when making actual progress uh, would be in the offing. Uh, we have re-engaged with the Palestinian Authority. We have re-engaged with the Palestinian people uh, just within recent days. We have announced additional funding for UNRWA. Uh, the United States is uh, now once again uh, engaged in the region. We're, of course, uh, also in deeply engaged with our Israeli partners as well. Uh, but You've heard us say many times that the time isn't right, doesn't appear to be right for the parties to actually uh, make progress. Well, but, I mean, this is the point. Why isn't it right? I mean, no issue has been so negotiated over so many decades with every little detail. And basically, everybody knows what the outcome ought to look like. You, know, you all agree there is a territory occupied. I mean, you know, you began by saying country after country condemned the 
the Russian occupation of parts of Ukraine and so on. Well, country after country has condemned the Israeli occupation of parts of Syria, parts of the Palestinian territory, and parts of Lebanon and so on. So everybody really knows what's going on. I mean, what is the holdup? Why can't we get this? And instead of kicking the can down the road, you know, take the initiative and say, well, this is it. Or for the United States, perhaps, to say, this is how I envision this two-state two, two solution not to look like. So I don't think any of us are under any illusions that the United States uh, taking this, mat this matter into our own hands uh, in a unilateral way and presenting it as a fait accompli or uh, something along those lines uh, would be, would in any way uh, further the cause uh, of a two-state solution, would further the cause uh, of peace, uh, lasting uh, negotiated peace between Israelis and Palestinians. We want to see a two-state solution. Equally, we don't want to do anything that would aggravate tensions, that would make achieving a two-state solution all the more difficult. So in this intervening period, it's our task to do what we can uh, to, little by little, uh, fulfill what is our overriding policy goal, to see to it that Israelis and Palestinians enjoy equal measures of security, of stability, of prosperity, of opportunity, uh, and of dignity. And that's something that uh, can't take place um, overnight, but it is something that we have worked on since the earliest days of this administration, and it's something that we'll continue to work on uh, going forward. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I have actually a follow-up on Iran. So you said that the protests in Iran are not about us, and it's not related to GCPOA, but now the United States is part of the protests because you have sanctioned several officials and institutions, also a U.S. companies providing Starlink, and you encourage U.S. companies to provide hardware, software to the area for communications. So can you promise the people of Iran who are on streets now that even if you reach an agreement with Iran on GCPOA, you will continue your support to this, the people and you will continue to sanction Iranian institution and officials? Absolutely, 100%. These protests are not about us, as I said before. They are about the legitimate aspirations of the Iranian people. The Iranian people know these are not about us. They know that they are peacefully taking to the streets because they saw what happened to Masa Amini. They have seen years, they have seen decades of mismanagement, of corruption, of repression, uh, of human rights abuses. No one would like this like these protests to be about us more than the Iranian regime. What frightens, I think, the Iranian regime more than anything is the knowledge that these are the organic expressions of the legitimate aspirations of their own people. Only the Iranian regime uh, can fully satisfy uh, their aspirations, but we will continue uh, to do everything we can to support the legitimate aspirations of the Iranian people to exercise rights that are as universal to them as they are uh, to people anywhere and everywhere. And a separate, a separate topic, sorry. Uh, Greece has recently deployed tens of armored vehicles and tanks to the islands of non-military status just close to Turkish mainland. Um, and um, are you, aren't you concerned that uh, this uh, tensions or escalations provoked by um, by, by Greece is actually mounting? Our basic premise is that at a time when Russia has once again invaded a sovereign state and uh, the transatlantic community and the international community is standing with the people of Ukraine and against uh, Russian aggression, uh, now is not the time for statements or uh, any actions uh, that could raise tensions between uh, NATO allies. We continue to encourage our NATO allies to work together to maintain peace and security in the region and to resolve any, any uh, differences they may have diplomatically. Uh, Jeremy, on this, on this uh, can you tell us if these islands are belong to Greece or to Turkey? Uh, again, uh, it is, uh, we are encouraging our NATO allies to resolve any disagreements they may have uh, diplomatically. But what, think, is, what is the U.S. position on this? We think we should remain focused uh, on what is a collective threat to all of us, and that's that's Russia's aggression. Uh, yes, sir. 
Thank you, uh, Ned. Um, I have a question about Ethiopia. Uh, the first one is millions of Ethiopians <laughs> believe that the Biden administration blocks the economic opportunity for many Ethiopian workers when the Biden administration decided to terminate the African Opportunity Act, uh, which is known as AGOA, trade uh, preference program for Ethiopia. The suspension of Ethiopia from AGOA harms many hardworking Ethiopians. If the United States supports Ethiopians with economic opportunity, which uh, Secretary uh, Blinken said many times, uh, does the U.S. administration plan to reinstate Ethiopia's eligibility to AGOA? So AGOA, or the African Growth and Opportunity Act, as the name suggests, is a piece of legislation. Uh, it is, because it is legislation, it is written into law, the criteria under which any country uh, is eligible for AGOA and the requirements that uh, any country, in this case in Africa, must meet uh, in order to remain a part of AGOA. We did determine late last year that uh, Ethiopia, uh, given the statutory uh, language written into law, passed by Congress, uh, was uh, no longer, was not eligible uh, for AGOA, but of course, uh, we want to see to it that the conditions that led to that suspension are reversed. We would love to be able to uh, uh, re-engage uh, with Ethiopia uh, under AGOA, knowing the tremendous economic opportunity that it has brought not only to Ethiopia in the past, but to other parts of the continent as well. Uh, uh, Follow-up question. Um, uh, as you know, we have been talking uh, many times about the conflict in Ethiopia. Uh, when the Ethiopian military entered the Tigray region, uh, the State Department repeatedly demanded that the Ethiopian government withdraw its troops from uh, the Tigray region. But when the TPLA forces entered Amhara and Afra region, the State Department, instead of demanding the TPLA to withdraw its forces from uh, Amhara and Afra region, uh, the State Department demand, demanded that both parties need to find a peaceful solution. And once again, uh, uh, most Ethiopians believe that the United States supports T TPLA and ask, why does the United States support TPLA? What is your response to the Ethiopian people who say that the United States supports the PLA? We support the cause of peace. We support uh, stability uh, and security for the people of Ethiopia. Our message has been a simple one. We've called on the government of Ethiopia and the Tigray regional authorities to immediately halt their military offensives and to pursue a negotiated settlement through peace talks under the auspices of the African Union. We've worked very closely with the African Union, with other partners uh, on the continent to engage in that process of diplomacy. We've also been very clear uh, with Eritrea and Eritrean authorities that they must withdraw uh, to their borders immediately and for Eritrea and others to cease uh, fueling uh, the conflict. Uh, we're deeply concerned by the human rights abuses that this conflict has uh, brought about. Uh, we know Again, alluding to your question, uh, the opportunity that for the people of Ethiopia, uh, that would come with, and for a while that did come, uh, with a negotiated truce and a negotiated uh, ceasefire are tremendous. Uh, we are doing everything we can to uh, see to it uh, that the African Union, through its diplomatic efforts, uh, is successful in bringing a halt to the violence, which in turn would allow humanitarian access to parts of northern Ethiopia, and once again, uh, bring uh, levels of opportunity for uh, all of the people of Ethiopia. Yes. Uh, is there a draft agreement uh, ready to be delivered this week to Israel and Lebanon on the maritime border? I don't have any updates to offer you on our diplomacy when it comes to Israel and Lebanon on the maritime border. Uh, you know that the secretary met with Prime Minister Makati of Lebanon last week. Amos Hochstein was also in New York uh, last week where he held uh, engagements with uh, Israeli and Lebanese uh, officials. Uh, we've stressed in all of our engagements the need uh, to conclude a maritime agreement uh, to ensure stability uh, and uh, to help support Lebanon's economy. We are working as uh, diligently as we can to narrow the divide uh, and to continue uh, the progress that we've seen in recent weeks. Uh, move yes, Simon. Yeah, could, um, since the secretary is meeting the foreign minister of Pakistan today, um, a couple of questions about that. Um, in the aftermath of the um, 
uh, Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, the secretary was in was in Congress, and he was asked about um, U.S. relations with Pakistan, and particularly the question of whether Pakistan um, offered support to the to the Taliban during the obviously the twenty year uh, war there. And the secretary said, you know, that's something we're looking at. We're in the coming days, uh, weeks, and months. I think he said um, we're going to look at that and look at the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. So I wonder, you know, what, whatever came of, of that sort of review within the State Department or within the, within the administration um, on whether, whether Pakistan was, um, you know, aiding the Taliban and, and what response you've had to, you know, to that in terms of your relationship. And, and just um, additional to that, um, since the Secretary is also meeting the Foreign Minister of India later, um, Foreign Minister Jai Shankar said in a speech yesterday, um, was well, was very critical of uh, the U.S. money to the F-16 program in Pakistan, um, and raising the same similar questions, I guess, over what benefit the U.S. has had, what are the merits of, of its relationship with Pakistan. Um, so I wonder if you could respond to that. As well. I, it would be difficult for me to attempt to summarize 20 years of U.S.-Pakistani relationships relations between uh, 2001 and. <laughs> 2021, I, I suppose what I uh, would say broadly, of course, is that Pakistan was not a monolith during that time. We saw different governments uh, and we saw uh, with the passage of years, different approaches uh, to uh, the Taliban and to uh, Afghanistan at the time. Uh, now we recognize uh, this government, which by the way, came into uh, office following the uh, the um, the, the fall of the government in Kabul last year. Uh, but we recognize, and uh, one of the many reasons we're meeting with Pakistan is because of the shared security interests that we do have. It is neither in our interests nor in Pakistan's interest uh, to see instability, uh, to see violence uh, in Afghanistan. So as uh, the secretary uh, meets with uh, Foreign Minister Zardari today, uh, I. Uh, would imagine that uh, security and shared security interests will be high on the agenda, as will uh, humanitarian concerns. And of course, the United States has been uh, intently focused on the devastation that uh, has resulted in the loss of life that has been that has resulted from uh, the torrential floods that have devastated large areas of uh, Pakistan. Uh, we have uh, provided tens of millions of dollars in relief. Uh, for these floods. The Secretary today uh, will have additional details on further uh, U.S. assistance for uh, the Pakistani people in light of uh, this humanitarian emergency uh, that Pakistanis are uh, facing. Uh, remind me of the second part of your question. Um, the Foreign Minister Jai Shankar's comments uh, basically calling on the U.S. to, to review its relationship with, with Pakistan and criticizing the, uh, the fact that you um, recently uh, authorized fund, uh, I think $400 million, $450 million for the F-16 program? Well, we don't view our relationship with Pakistan, and on the other hand, we don't view our relationship <laughs> with India as in relation to one another. Uh, these are both partners of ours uh, with different points of emphasis in each, uh, and we look to both as partners because uh, we do have, in many cases, uh, shared values. We do have, in many cases, shared interests. Uh, and the relationship uh, we have with uh, India stands on its own. The relationship we have uh, with Pakistan stands on its own. Uh, we also want to do everything we can to see to it that uh, these neighbors have relations with one another that are as constructive uh, as can be possible. And so that's another point uh, of emphasis. And specifically on, on, you know, Yes, I, I get your point on, on there being a new government, but, you know, it's the, the Pakistani military, the, the, uh, the establishment there, um, was sort of what the secretary was being asked about last year. Um, you know, so was there a review of, uh, you know, and specifically, I guess, not just over the 20 years, but in the, in the, in the last phase of the war, did Pakistan aid the Taliban in a way that allowed them to come into Kabul. You know, was, that, was that something that was reviewed? Was there a conclusion? Did it have any impact? When it, when it comes to security partners of ours, uh, we're always taking a close look at their actions, at, at their activities. Uh, I, I'm not in a position to, to detail for you uh, precisely what we found, but the bottom line, as I believe the Secretary said at the time and uh, remains true now, is that 
it was not in Pakistan's interest to see, to see instability and violence in Afghanistan. It is not in Pakistan's interest to see instability and violence uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the uh, support for the people of Afghanistan is something we discuss regularly with our Pakistani uh, partners. Uh, our efforts to improve the lives and livelihoods, uh, the humanitarian conditions of uh, the Afghan people, uh, and to see to it that the Taliban live up to the commitments that they have made. And of course, Pakistan is implicated in many of these same commitments. The counterterrorism commitments, commitments to safe passage, uh, commitments to uh, the citizens of Afghanistan, uh, the unwillingness or the inability on the part of the Taliban to live up to these commitments uh, would have significant implications for Pakistan as well. And so for that reason, we do share uh, a number of interests uh, with Pakistan regarding uh, its neighbor. Yes. Um, Italian New Jersey answer. Uh, I have a question about the last uh, election in Italy in our country yesterday. Uh, what do you expect from the next Italian government after this election? And uh, do you share the alarm for democracy in Italy after this election? Well, the next Italian government hasn't been formed, so uh, it is not my place to, to speak to any future governments in Italy. But of course, uh, Italy and the United States are close allies. We're partners. We're friends. Uh, last year, if I recall, we celebrated 160 years of diplomatic relations. Uh, Secretary Blinken's uh, Italian counterpart was the first in-person bilateral engagement we had here at the department. He and Secretary Blinken wrote an op-ed uh, together on the occasion of our 160 years of diplomatic relations, uh, heralding our commitment over the course of decades. Uh, for human rights and the, the values that we share in the world. The fact is that we stand ready and eager to work with any Italian government that emerges from the electoral process uh, to advance our many shared goals and, and interests. And when it comes to that cooperation, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't um, say a word about outgoing Prime Minister Draghi. Uh, we thank him for his strong, for his visionary leadership through a critical time in Italian, in European, in, in world history, uh, again, as well as his dedication to the values that our countries have shared for decades now. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get to ask you. Okay, okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. Ned, on uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, you were in the room when the secretary met with the uh, foreign ministers uh, last week. What was your sense in the room? Are the sides genuinely interested in the peacemaking process? I, I will let the two sides speak to their, their attitudes. It was important for us uh, and for the secretary in particular uh, to bring the two sides together. Of course, the secretary had had uh, conversations with uh, the two leaders, uh, but this was the first face-to-face -face meeting that uh, the two foreign ministers uh, had since the latest outbreak of, of violence. Uh, the secretary um, noted to both leaders the uh, importance uh, of maintaining the ceasefire, of uh, maintaining the calm, so noted that we're dedicated to a sustainable ceasefire and to a, a peaceful resolution. Uh, we uh, made clear to both foreign ministers that the United States stands ready uh, to support um, to support this bilaterally, uh, multilaterally, together with partners. Uh, this includes our support for uh, efforts by EU Council President uh, Charles Michel to bring the leaders uh, together. Um, they, during the course of that meeting, discussed the best path forward, and the Secretary suggested uh, the side share ideas for how to meaningfully advance the peace process uh, before the end of the month. Uh, our message uh, has been consistent uh, for some time. We call on Azerbaijan to return troops to their initial positions. We urge disengagement of military forces and work to resolve all outstanding issues between Armenia and Azerbaijan through peaceful negotiations. The use of force is not an acceptable path. We've made that clear privately. We've also made that clear uh, publicly. And we're glad that our continued engagement, including at high levels, including last week in New York, uh, with both countries has helped to halt hostilities and will continue to engage and encourage the work needed to reach a lasting peace uh, because there can be and there is no military solution 
uh, to this conflict. Is there to urge them to meet again before the end of the month? Do you have any particular venue and date in your mind? This will be up to the two countries to decide, but we do think that continued engagement directly between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, is not only in their interests, it's in the interests of uh, the region and beyond. Uh, we have offered to be of assistance, again, bilaterally, trilaterally, multilaterally, uh, and of course, the EU is playing an important role as well. The Azeri president's advisor is in town, and in fact, he met with uh, Assistant Secretary Donfrey this morning. Do you have any readout, or is it part of the process that you guys are putting together? We, we are in regular contact with uh, both uh, Armenian and, and uh, uh, Azeri officials. Uh, that will continue. The experts say that, you know, the U.S. suggests you know, urging or encouraging the sides meeting again, suggests that the U.S. now has no plan to move the process forward. Do you have a plan? Uh, again, as we've discussed in other contexts, uh, the United States is not and cannot be in a position uh, to submit uh, a plan as a fait accompli. Uh, our task is to bring the sides together, to facilitate dialogue, to help the sides together <clears throat> work through differences, to work through disagreements peacefully uh, and diplomatically. And that's what last week was about. That's what our continued engagement yeah. is about. A uh, final question in the back. Yes, uh, can you take a question, uh, and you can answer me later or tomorrow about the Greek islands, because I see a note here from your press office saying, quote, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries should be respected and protected. Greece's sovereignty over these islands is not a question. Can you take my question and answer me tomorrow? I'll, I'll see if we have any more details to provide you that. Please. All right. Can I have a last question, please? Good. Thank you. On North Korea. As you know, North Korea fired the ballistic missiles into the East Sea yesterday. Can you presume that there is a possibility of North Korea's further provocation, such as a SLBM or seventh nuclear test? We've spoken of North Korea's pattern of provocations in recent months. We've warned repeatedly that North Korea uh, could well conduct another nuclear test, its seventh nuclear test, with no warning. Uh, we've seen North Korea test ICBMs, uh, shorter range systems uh, as well. None of these provocations have or will change our essential orientation. Uh, that is our stalwart commitment to the defense of uh, the ROK in Japan, our treaty allies, of course, the vice president uh, is in the region now to uh, represent the United States at the funeral of Prime Minister Abe. She'll travel to the ROK uh, as well to show our support uh, for our treaty allies. Uh, we've made clear together with uh, our allies in the region that we are prepared for meaningful dialogue, meaningful diplomacy uh, to help advance the prospects for a complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. This offer of dialogue and diplomacy has, at least so far, been met only with uh, additional provocations. Uh, North Korea tends to go through, the DPRK tends to go through periods of provocation, periods of engagement. It's very clear that we're in a period of provocation now. We are going to continue to work with our treaty allies to uh, enhance their defense and their deterrence uh, and to be ready uh, if and when North Korea the DPRK, excuse me, is ready to engage uh, in diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.